what the hell? There aren't 100 people looking down at their laps with their thumbs furiously at Twitter? I'm not used to that. I teach in college classrooms, so thank you very much. <clears throat> we need good stories. We've always needed good stories. From the caves of Lascaux in the southwest corner of France, where the pictographs on the walls of those caves are carbon dated 17,500 years ago, pictographs that show what a specific group of people were doing at a specific point in time in a specific place, we need those stories. We need the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Abraham, Muhammad, Shakespeare, Chaucer, Milton, Dostoevsky, Hemingway, Faulkner, Steinbeck, and for my money, the best storyteller that America has right now, Miss Louise Erdrich, an Ojibwe woman from Minneapolis. We need those stories. We will always need those stories. Mankind, womankind, humankind, because knowing who we were yesterday helps tell us who we are today and foreshadows who we are going to become tomorrow. And I would like to tell you one of those stories. A story about a middle-aged chief, a devoted father of a small, obscure tribe that settled in a remote corner of the northern Great Plains, who brought the United States Army to its knees, defeated the United States government without ever firing a shot from his rifle, without ever plucking an arrow from his quiver, without ever unsheathing his scalping knife. He was able to defeat the United States government and its powerful army. And he did it a few blocks from where we are right now, on the corner of 15th and Dodge Streets, where the Doubletree Hotel is now. He did it with a writ of habeas corpus, and he did it with something else. He did it with strength, courage, integrity, honesty, and most importantly, he was able to triumph in the end with humanity, with humanity. His name was Chief Standing Bear. Our good friend, Mr. Wendell Berry, the fine, fine poet and essayist from Kentucky, once wrote, if you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. If you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. And you can all think about that and put it into your own personal lives, your own neighborhoods, your own churches, your own communities, your state, the part of the country you live in, and see how important that is. If you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. Chief Standing Bear and his 750 Ponca knew who they were because they knew where they were. And why shouldn't they? They had lived in their beautiful homeland near the confluence of the Niobrara and Missouri River for more than 200 years. They knew every rock and rock formation. They knew the trees. They knew the animals. And most of all, they knew the seven sacred hills surrounding their beautiful homeland where they buried their dead. They had sunk one of the deepest cultural tap roots into this lush valley that any ethnographer coming across the Mississippi in the post-Civil War era, of all the tribes they'd studied, they concluded the Ponca's tap root into their homeland was as deep as any tribe west of the Mississippi. They loved this beautiful homeland. They transformed this lush valley into fields of wheat, corn, pumpkin, squash, Bountiful harvest that helped thousands of settlers sweeping across the Mississippi in those post-Civil War years, surviving Nebraska winters. So you can imagine the shock and the horror and the confusion and the sadness that reverberated through their winter village on one cold day in January 1877, near the confluence of the Miss Missouri and Niobrara rivers, when a strange white man from the east came to their village from all places, the Upper East Side of New York, with this thunderous bombshell that the great white father in Washington wanted all 750 Ponca to leave their sacred homeland and go to the Indian Territory, which would morph into the state of Oklahoma in 1907. Now, truthfully, no Nebraskan is moving to Oklahoma. <laughs> not then, not now, not ever. <laughs> and I apologize to my Oklahoma friends. And Standing Bear said no. He said no. Not one U.S. Senate treaty says this is our homeland, but two U.S. Senate treaties say this is our homeland. And so they slapped him in leg irons and handcuffs, threw him in the back of a buckboard wagon, ran him 70 miles up the Missouri River to Fort Randall and threw him in the stockade. And still he would not agree to leave his beloved homeland. 
And then the army began withholding food from the 750 Ponca clustered in their winter village near the Niobrara and Missouri River. And then they began withholding water and food. And after a couple of days, the very old became very weak and the very young became very weak. And the word got back to standing during the stockade at Fort Randall. And he had the only decision that a chief could make, whose primary objective was always the overarching concern for his people. And so Standing Bear reluctantly relented. And so in May of 1877, the Ponca people, all 750, turned their faces south, and with bayonets to their back, they began walking from the South Dakota border all the way through Nebraska, all the way through Kansas, into Oklahoma, where they were unceremoniously dumped on the land no housing, no food, no clothing, no farming implements, but a cluster of cheap army canvas tents. And they gathered themselves into the creeks and the ravines of Oklahoma where they found a humidity and a heat that they had never experienced before, these hardy, cold weather northern people. So they clustered in these ravines during the summer of 1877, ravines filled with the heat and the humidity and swarming with mosquitoes. And in one year, between the summer of 1877 and 1878, more than one-third of the Ponca tribe had died. Sometimes entire families died in a week and were buried in this land that they did not understand. They did not know who they were anymore because they did not know where they were. And on Christmas week of 1878, Standing Bear's only son, a 16-year-old boy by the name of Bear Shield, lay curled in a fetal position on the bottom of a cheap army canvas tent dying of malaria. This is a boy that Standing Bear had invested an enormous amount of time, effort, and energy in because he believed Bear Shield would be the bridge from the old way of life to the new way of life, that the Ponca people could go across Bear Shield's bridge and function in the new world order but still retain their cultural identity. So he had sent him to schools to learn the white man's history and political system. He had sent him to school to learn English. He had sent him to a missionary school to learn about the white man's God. But four days before Christmas, on 1878, the boy lay dying on this army canvas tent in Oklahoma. But before his eyes closed in death, Bear Shield extracted a promise from his father, the chief, that upon his death, Standing Bear would take his body and never bury it in the soil of Oklahoma, but take it back to their beloved homeland. And so on January 2nd, 1879, about one o'clock in the afternoon, Standing Bear wrapped the body of his only son in his best clothes, wrapped him in a buffalo robe, put him in the back of a rickety wagon, and he and 29 others, 11 men, 10 women, 9 children, began walking from north central Oklahoma back to the Nebraska-South Dakota border. They had very little food, very little winter clothing, very little money, and on the day they left, January 2nd, 1879, the air temperature on the road up ahead that day was 19 below zero. Not the wind chill, the air temperature was 19 below zero. They kept walking and on the third day out, January 3rd, the blizzard coming in out of Canada intensified and the wind chill dropped to 77 below. So they began to tunnel into haystacks and open fields and stick the very old people in the tunnels and stick the very young people in the tunnels to keep them from freezing to death. The men rummaged for field corn by day, boiled it open, open fire, and they kept going one week at a time, one month at a time. And when they were going in 77 below wind chill with little food, little clothing, little money, at that point in our history, the United States government had signed 371 treaties with the native people of America. And they had broken all 371 treaties. But Standing Bear was not going to break the promise that he had made his son. And so they kept going, and they kept tunneling into haystacks. And they got to within two days of the beloved homeland, and the army caught them. Turned their faces south, marched them back to Fort Omaha, just a couple of miles from here, and put them in the stockade. And then a constellation of characters and events coalesced that had never happened before in the history of the United States. People from all kinds of places, because of the humanity that came out of this man in conversation after conversation through interpreters, brought people out of the shadows who began to rally around this middle-aged, devoted father's flag in a way that had never happened before. 
And eventually, it culminated in a trial at the corner of 15th and Dodge Streets, which then was occupied by a three-story Yellowstone monolithic brick building on the second floor of which housed a federal courtroom. Housed the U.S. federal courtroom. And towards the end of the trial, the judge announced that he had made a decision regarding the last moments of the trial that had never been done before, but he had agreed one last speaker to have the floor. And everybody in this jam-packed courthouse a couple of blocks from here watched in silence as this middle-aged man stood up from his bench, walked to the front of this jam-packed courthouse, and began one of the most remarkable speeches in U.S. history. He held up his hand for a long time and began by saying, this hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, I shall feel pain. If you pierce your hand, you also will feel pain. The color that will come from my hand, the blood, will be of the same color as yours. I am a man. The same God made us both. When Standing Bear finished, there was total silence in the courtroom for a long time. And that silence was eventually broken by the sound of women softly weeping in the back of the courtroom. And moments later, the Brigadier General of the United States, George Crook, jumped up from his bench, the defendant in the case, and rushed over to shake Standing Bear's hand. And before long, a number of others had done the same. And then the bailiffs asked for order in the courtroom, and the judge said he would take this case under advisement and issue an opinion within a couple of weeks. And about two weeks later, Judge Elmer Dundee, a grizzly bear hunting, Indian hating judge, rendered a decision that had never happened in the 103 year history of our country, which was from this day forward, Standing Bear and people who look like Standing Bear were under the law to be considered a person with the same constitutional privileges as the more fortunate white race. Our friend Mr. Picasso was fond of saying that the purpose of art is to wash the dust of daily life from our souls. To wash the dust of daily life from our souls. I want to tweak that a little bit. I want to transform and cannibalize it a little bit and recast it in the form of a good story has transformative powers. A good story can and should inspire us to look deeper into ourselves, to look deeper into ourselves and confront ourselves with two of the most haunting and complicated questions that we can ask. Who are we? Who are we at 3 o'clock in the morning when all the masks are put away, when all the artifices are stripped away, when all the games are put away? Who is that person looking back at us in the mirror at 3 o'clock in the morning? And secondly, what is it that I really believe in? What is it that I really value? That's what stories can do. That's what powerful, good stories can do. And not long after the trial, when Standing Bear and the 29 others were set free, he launched along with the crusading Omaha World Herald journalist, Thomas Henry Tibbles, a dazzling Omaha Indian poet by the name of Bright Eyes and her brother, began a long summer, fall, and winter speaking to her up and down the United States, trying to capture the momentum of this historic verdict and catapult it into citizenship rights for Native American people. And they spoke to thousands of people in Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Washington. For two days, Standing Bear had sat on the, s the witness stand and he was grilled relentlessly by a young, brash federal prosecutor, Genio Lambertson, who was trying his first case in federal court. And for two days, Standing Bear endured this withering assault of who are you? And what does it mean to be a chief? And do your people follow your orders? And who is your God? And what does your God believe in? And what would you do if we let you free to go back home? But I would argue that all through the summer and fall and winter, of 1879, during this speaking tour, the stories of which landed on the front pages of the great newspapers and in the editorial columns, Standing Bear was holding up a mirror to America, and he was asking the questions. He was asking of Americans, who am I? No, who are you? 
And what is it that you believe in? And tell me about this thing called democracy. And who is your God? And what does your God believe in? And in the end, if you read the stories, and if you read the editorials, and if you saw what happened in Congress, in the end, Standing Bear enabled Americans to be better than they thought they could be. He set a bar higher than they had seen before and asked them to jump over it, and they did. And they did. In Omaha, during his trial, surrounded by this constellation of incredible characters, judges, lawyers, crusading journalists, Omaha Indian poets, the Jewish community of Omaha stepped out of the shadows and began hitting up white people for money to defend an American Indian in 1879. Do you think that happened every week in 1800s? It happened only once in Omaha, Nebraska, May, April, March of 1879. And he inspired each of these people that came in contact with him to be better than they thought they could be. Brigadier General George Crook was never a more courageous, valiant soldier than he was when he tipped off the Oma, what would become the Omaha World Herald about this case. The crusading journalist was never a better journalist than when he was stumping on behalf of Standing Bear and the Ponca, trying to bring civil rights to this journey. Andrew Jackson Poppleton, the silver-haired, silver-tongued lawyer, the general counsel of Union Pacific Railroad, was never a better lawyer than when he was representing Standing Bear, and he said as much in his memoirs 20 years later. So that is the power of a good story. If we encounter these stories, they can inspire us to look deeper into ourselves and to our relationships with our family and our loved ones and our friends. And if we are honest with that confrontation of ourselves, we can be inspired to look at the world with more compassionate and sensitive eyes. And that is, again, the gift that Standing Bear's story brought us. So I would say... If we were to create a mythological table of American history heroes and put it right here on this stage, and if I handed out ballots to everybody in this room and you got three choices, and I collected all of your ballots and I tabulated the votes, I'm guessing when all the votes were in that that resolute rail splitter from Springfield, Illinois is going to be sitting at this table. I'm going way out on a limb and predicting that that celebrated kite flyer from Philadelphia is going to grab a seat at that table. I'm going to suggest that the man who wrote those magnificent letters about freedom from a Birmingham jail cell is going to be at our table, and I'm also going to guess that that woman who on December 1st, 1955, after having spent all day washing somebody else's dirty clothes, ironing somebody else's wrinkled clothes, washing somebody else's dirty dishes, cleaning somebody else's dirty house, who just wanted to sit on that bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and rest her weary bones, and had no sooner done so when she was asked to stand up and give her seat to a white man, and she replied with a simple one-word answer. And that answer was, no. No. So it would not shame me or embarrass me in any way if we were to approach our mythological table of American history heroes, and we came up to it, and we saw a single empty chair, and above that chair a brass nameplate that said simply, Reserved Chief Standing Bearer. Thank you very much.